Hello, uh, it's Dr. Ken with a lecture from our Chaucer's England class uh, that I'm titling Sacred Space, in which we're talking about the church um, and its architecture and a certain number of other factors related to it. So the lecture themes of today uh, concern the presence of religion in everyday lives uh, of people in the Middle Ages, trends in church building, <clears throat> in particular the perpendicular Gothic. We'll talk about parish priests and chantry priests, the latter being something that many of you won't be familiar with. Um, attitudes to the church and to reform. We're covering some ground that we've gone over before. Uh, and we'll think about attitudes and actions of the elites uh, in relation to the church. And, uh, and, and some examples of this will be in the form of what, we, what are called roof bosses, but embellishment of churches by the elites during a period in which, interestingly enough, charity is in decline. So, um, religion in everyday life. Well, uh, I've, I've stressed this point before that everyone at the time, w probably, or at least officially, was Christian and Catholic in medieval England. <clears throat> um, and so Christianity figures exceedingly prominently into people's lives in ways that we can't quite relate to today. So um, one, of course, one obvious way has to do with, with the way that time is, is, is dealt with. And history, you know, up until relatively recently, was reckoned from the birth of Christ, um, you know, Anno Domini and BC. Um, still used today in some cases, but it certainly was used back then. The year itself is divided up into saints' days, feast days, and other holy days. So the calendar, uh, in addition to being, you know, a way to mark time and, and, and you know, indicating when one plows or plants, it's also, um, you know, moving from one holiday to another, one holy day to another. The day itself um, is divided up into different times. So uh, starting with midnight, matins, these are periods of prayer and, and, and monks especially are expected to, to perform prayer at these times of day. So matins is at midnight, louds is at 3 p.m., sorry, 3 a.m. rather, prime is at either sunrise or 6 a.m., vesper is at 6 p.m., compline at bedtime. So one, two, three, four, five, six, sorry, one, two, three, four, five, five times a day, um, people are expected to pray in Christianity. In that sense, you know, not dissimilar from, from Islam. Um, not everyone did this, of course. It was more the priests, um, certain priests and monks. But still, in addition to that, in, in the, amongst the clergy, there were daily masses. Um, and then high mass on Sunday and 40 days of obligation in which um, other sermon or other um, religious ceremonies took place. The church at this time is described as Christocentric, that is focusing on Jesus Christ. So it's, it's a doctrinal term within Christianity describing theological positions that focus on Christ, who's the second person of the, the, the Trinity in relation to the Godhead that is God the Father. Uh, or the Holy Spirit. So if it were focusing on God the Father more, we'd call that theocentric, and on the Holy Spirit, pneumocentric for the word for spirit. But the church is Christocentric. These theologies make Christ the central theme about which all other theological positions and doctrines are oriented. Certain theological traditions within the, the Christian church can be described as more heavily Christocentric, notably the teachings of, of St. Augustine, the Bishop of Hippo, um, as well as Paul of Tarsus, which have been very influential in the West. Um, they place a great deal of emphasis on the person of Jesus in the process of salvation. Part of this derives from earlier schisms and heresies in the church, uh, debating you know, the, the, the role of Christ when he was on earth, um, 
one what became a heresy known as Arianism believed that he was mortal while he was alive um, and, and so God becomes mortal and then turns back into God. The Christian church, uh, the official position of the Catholic church is no, he was always God before, during and after the time he was alive. Um, so that's something to think about in, in you know, ways, again, that we don't perceive these things. The other thing worth mentioning that's quite big in this period concerns architecture and the church, and, and, and it's, it's sort of two phenomena, really. One has to do with wealthy individuals donating lots of money to the church, which is already quite rich, uh, for the building of, 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 new, of new church buildings or architecture of various types cathedrals and so forth um, the, and of course as I say the church is wealthy we reckon about a third of the wealth in medieval England was in the hands of the church a third of the total wealth in any given country so uh, what develops in this period is known as the decorated or perpendicular style or perpendicular gothic style uh, and this it's the name of this architectural style that flourished in England and it, it seems to have been uniquely English although the the originators of it may have come from the continent and probably did come from the continent but it seems to have been a, a uniquely English phenomenon though it spread to the continent from about 1180 until about 1520 um, so initially it's 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 small steps um, and then and mainly to do with window tracery and things like that so Decorated architecture is characterized by window tracery. You'll be seeing some examples here. These are elaborate windows, subdivided, but closely spaced um, parallel mullions, they're called. These are vertical bars of stone, usually up to the level of the arched uh, top of the window where it begins. The mullions are then branch out and cross, intersecting to fill the, the, the top part of the window with a mesh of elaborate patterns called tracery. They typically uh, include trefoils and quatrefoils. The, uh, the trefoils probably represent the trinity. The quatrefoils, I'm not sure what they represent, possibly uh, the four elements or virtues, but uh, they all have symbolic meaning as well as being pretty. Um, the style was geometrical uh, at first and, 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 then, and then develops into a more flowing uh, type of, of, of tracery in the later period. Um, the flowing or flamboyant tracery was introduced in the first quarter of the 14th century. So this comes about in, in, in this period. It lasted about 50 years. Um, and there's a kind of evolution that, that takes place. And it's not just in the windows that we start getting this. Um, it's also in the vaulting of churches. So this is the, the roof top of the church, the, 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 the vaulting, which is part of the structure. Um, but they became more elaborate with the use of increasing numbers of, of ribs and again often a bit like the windows uh, in ornate um, curvilinear uh, shapes. Initially it, it's purely structural but then it becomes an aesthetic matter and what's going on is because of, of these advancements in church building uh, in architecture they're developing the flying buttress so that's moving away from the old heavy gothic or not gothic the old Romanesque style uh, with thick walls and small windows they can now have thinner walls because they've got the buttressing to hold up the walls and the roof so the windows become bigger and more elaborate um, arches are generally equilateral and the moldings bolder in, than in the early english period with less depth in the hollows um, and, and the fillet that's a narrow flat band largely used and, and different designs, different types that I put into the notes are present there. Um, you can see some examples of, of the vaulting and, and some of the and other exterior ornamentation. So the perpendicular Gothic is, is characterized by a lot of vertical lines as if reaching up, reaching up to heaven as it were, uh, to, 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 to reach God. Um, and uh, the, as I say, the emphasis is on vertical lines, also known as the international Gothic, the rectilinear, or the late Gothic. And this style begins to emerge in 13, around 1350. Notice, and this is not coincidence, that um, it, it coincides roughly with the Black Death. So um, it seems to have been a peculiar response to the Black Death, an attempt to appeal directly to God 
with this divine, this sacred space of architecture, um, it, it marks a change. <clears throat> so um, the perpendicular style began to emerge around 1350. Uh, the earliest example of a fully formed perpendicular style is the chapter house of Old St. Paul's Cathedral, built by William Ramsey in 1332. Um, it was a development of the decorated style, which had begun in the late 13th century and early 14th, but then would last until the mid-16th. So it began under the royal architects William Ramsey and John Sponley, and fully developed uh, in the prolific works of Henry Yevil and William Winford. The style has been considered a, a specifically English reaction to the Black Death, um, with, the, uh, with the higher church structures seen, as I said, to be symbolically reaching to God uh, to seek divine assistance. Uh, in a reversal of the earlier Romanesque styles of architecture, that were borrowed from France, the perpendicular style was then widely copied on the continent. So we initially get our, our designs for churches um, from Europe, and then we come up with this new, in England, come up with a new design which gets exported abroad. We refer to the period from 1350 to 1520, which coincides with this Gothic uh, architecture, as the Great Rebuilding. Probably began, actually, uh, in the 13th century, but amongst the manorial class and the gentry, the minor gentry. Uh, so, so a lot of things are being rebuilt at this time, primarily because of, of, of a period of relative peace. Um, but these sort of filter down through uh, the social rankings and up the length of, of England right through to the 18th century. There are a number of potential factors that stimulated this building process, including population expansion after the recovery from the Black Death, uh, but it was going on, remember, population expansion was going on in the 13th century um, till the Black Death comes along. It, it picks up again later. Greater wealth as well. Um, for those who survived the Black Death, the Great Rebuilding uh, is a way of them showing off their status. And also the development of new building techniques and materials and, increasing, and an increasing sense of privacy and rank. That seems to come about, too, as a result of the Black Death. So these are social phenomena. But um, again, giving money to the church for architectural, for building things, and for elaborating and decorating the churches is a way of showing status, because wealthy patrons are uh, honored. One thing that's reflected in the architecture of sacred space during this period is an increased awareness of mortality. Um, and chantry chapels, as we'll see uh, in a moment, have, have something to do with this. So with a consistent and increased fear of death during the plague, surviving wealthy individuals, as I say, are giving large donations to the church for its own and their self-promotion in the eyes of God. Uh, remember we talked about prayer being a commodity. Well, donations to the church, too, are, are a kind of commodity. Death is one of the dominant themes of 14th and 15th century art. Um, we have a, here a painting by Giovanni di Paolo from 1443. It's characteristic of scenes personifying death as a figure who arrives unexpectedly as people are going for walks, uh, lying in beds, having picnics with lovers, and so on. An important subspecies of this is the depiction known as the dance of death, the dance macabre. Uh, this began, and you'll see the example there, this began as a, a, a popular theme of engraving and painting um, and, and continued on into the 15th century. So we'll come back to some doom paintings in a little bit. But uh, chantries, what are they? Well, uh, this is an English term for a fund established to pay for a priest to celebrate a song mass, or song masses is plural, for a specific specific purposes, usually for the soul of a deceased donor or, one of, or, or, or if the donor is still alive at the time for one of their relatives. Their endowments by the rich to pay for masses to be said for their own souls and for the souls of those they loved. Um, they could be taken as indications of religious anxiety at the time. Chantries multiplied in number up to the 15th century. They were endowed with lands given by donors the income from which maintained the chantry priest. The chantry chapel is a building on private land or a dedicated area within a greater church. So it could, it, could be an, it could just be an altar within the church, 
often, especially if there's a lot of money involved, it would be a separate uh, chapel within the church. It might even be a freestanding building as the one in the, the Chantry Chapel that survives from Wakefield there in the picture. Um, they might be dedicated to the owner, the donor's favorite saint, um, as, I, as I say, either within the larger church or as a separate building altogether. Many altars became richly endowed as well, often with gold furnishings and valuable vestments. So a perpetual pantry, chantry rather, might consist of one of several priests in an independent freestanding chapel. Uh, so there's one surviving in Knowsley in Leicestershire. Um, or that one in Wakefield that you can see there. Uh, or they might, as I say, be in the aisle of a greater church. If chantries were in religious communities, they were sometimes headed by a warden and, or an archpriest. Such chantries generally had constitutions directing the terms by which the priest might appoint, or might, rather might be appointed, um, and how they were to be supervised. The perpetual chantry was naturally the most expensive variety um, and the most prestigious. Um, a lesser option, as I say, might be a fixed term chantry, so a, a, a period of prayers for a period of time to fund masses by one or two priests at a side altar. Historians have found uh, the terms that survive in documents ranging from one to ten years to be the more common than the perpetual sort, because the perpetual chantry was very expensive. Um, this was, as you can imagine, a money spinner for the church. And when Henry VIII initiated the Reformation in England, Parliament passed an act in 1545 that defined chantries as representing misapplied funds and misappropriated lands. So they were then seized by, um, by the um, state. But as I say, they represent a, a sign of, um, of anxiety people concerned about the afterlife, concerned about their soul, hoping to, to, to get in God's good books, um, essentially with a bribe. We've talked about parish priests, uh, but we haven't really talked about what, what they're meant to be. And of course, if you're Catholic today, then you'll, you'll know we're Anglican, but um, we'll go over that now briefly. So they took communion on behalf of parishioners. This is called intercession. Um, they pay. They they pay. They were paid for by tithes, a tithe usually being either one tenth of one's income or a certain number of days worked for free on church land. Um, as chantry priests, by contrast, were paid by you know, endowments from the, from the parish, uh, guild, or individual bequest. But but parish priests were supported by their own parishes. We have some indication that following the Black Death, the parish priests, a lot of them, because they were ordained so quickly and, and often given to role given to individuals who wouldn't have necessarily normally be given them in the past, seem to show a poor quality of education. This varied according to social class. But after the Black Death, they're often illiterate, poorly educated, and give little attention to the parish sermons. They're in it basically for what they can get out of it. Uh, according to the Catholic Church, though, the definition of a parish priest, um, well, it, it defines a parish, firstly, as a portion of a diocese, and that's a division of, of territory under the Catholic Church, under the authority of a priest, legitimately appointed to secure in virtue of his office for the faithful dwelling therein the helps of religion. Um, the, the faithful are the parishioners, the priest, uh, the parochus, or the curate, or parish priest, or pastor, um, and I put in the notes how, you know, a parish is formed and uh, what defines it. You can see all these things um, as, as well. So, and we, we, we could call these pe people vicars too. They reside, of course, in the parish church. Um, and the parish church is effectively the center of the community. It's the place... Uh, tenants would go to pay their rent as well. Priests are meant to be celibate from the 13th century onwards. Um, of, there, there were various rulings prior to this, but it's, it's strictly reinforced or more strictly reinforced from the 13th century, although it doesn't look like it was that strictly reinforced or enforced until about the time of the Reformation. By the early Middle Ages, marriage of the clergy had fallen into disrepute. Church reformers aimed at concubinage and violation of the laws of chastity rather than of marriage. 
So um, that means that people were trying to stop priests from having concubines um, and, and other violations of laws of chastity rather than marriage. The decrees of the popes on celibacy in the early Middle Ages were not in fact adhered to. Strict observances of celibacy was demanded by Pope Gregory VII in 1073 to 85, um, who was the leader of the Cluniac reform, who forbade married priests to perform their duties. Celibacy became um, a firmly established practice in the mid 13th century, though, but again, not as strictly enforced. The Catholic Church used it as a means of preserving church land ownership because it prevented land from being, from being broken up and given to heirs. This seems to be a lot more to do with, with why celibacy was enforced with priests um, than any spiritual reason. So the idea is that if a priest doesn't have any wife or offspring, when he dies, any property that he may have owned goes to the church. Um, and we've asked the question before, is Ch on, the, on the theme of, of reform, is Chaucer's poor parson a Wycliffian reformer? Um, we talked a bit about this last time in the seminar, and, uh, you know, it's not clear. Chaucer hasn't made it clear to us if he is or not, um, for good reason. But, you know, of all the other clerical characters present, especially the monk and the, the friar, the poor parson is a very positive figure when the others are negative. The, the prioress might not be that bad, but she's vain, she's she's wealthy. She shouldn't be wealthy, but she is um, a, a little a little airy-headed as well. So um, the poor parson is the only one who's really portrayed in a positive light. And of course, we saw in the epilogue to the Man of Law's tale, the parson is called a lollard. Um, by the host as well as by the, um, and a heretic, by the, uh, the shipman. We know that he, he challenges um, the host when the host swears, because swearing, we know, is something that the law lords disapproved of. Um, what aileth the man so sinfully to swear, he says, uh, that has a Wycliffean ring to it, as they rejected swearing. Um, and so the host is actually right to wonder if he's a lollard, but um, even the, the priest swears a mild oath, benedictiae, which means bless you, bless us, bless my soul, something along those lines. Um, benedicte, uh, be blessed. It is like an oath, though, and, and it's, a, it's a different sort of oath, but still. He makes the host change his tune, though. He apologizes, and he wants to let the priest give a tale, but then the... Uh, the shipman rushes in to, to collapse the meaning of lollard and heretic. And as I suggested, um, you know, it matters less whether the, the parson really is a lollard or whether the, ho the host is right to call him one. Chaucer here is imagining the social resonances of lollardy and is figuring in rather minute detail, the lar larger cultural context in which lollardy is both an object of sympathy and scorn alike. Um, or that is at least one interpretation. So, as I say, I think it might capture a moment in which lollardy was tolerated, and the priest might be a lollard, but he also might not be, because it's still um, possibly a dangerous topic, and eventually it would be a dangerous topic altogether. I'll come back to that in a moment with Bishop Arundel. One thing the lollards did, though, that was incredibly popular um, uh, was preaching and preaching in the vernacular, in, in the, the common language, not giving a mass or a psalter in Latin or, or a, a psalm, but, but you know, preaching directly to the parishioners. There's a growing significance of this sort of thing in the church. It's not just the Lollards who are doing it. So um, by the Middle Ages, they had migrated to the nave in the guise of a pulpit uh, and a lectern where sermons would be given. Before the consolidation of the pulpit as a, as a permanent fixture from the mid-14th century, preachers either used side altars or chancel steps or a portable square and somewhat makeshift utilitarian raised platform, which is sometimes illustrated in manuscripts. And I'll find some examples to put up for you there. Um, the authorities clearly felt a need to regularize this process. Uh, this informal arrangement and with more dignified structures like we see today. So, so the, the altar or the pulpit, um, which is a more permanent feature. 
the, the arrival in England from the late 12th century of the mendicant friars injected new life into the practice of preaching. Already firmly established since at least the 7th century, the friars were in stiff competition with traditional parish churches in return for the alms of the faithful. Uh, they were offering attractive burial rites and hosting of chantries as well for the deceased in their churches. So the friars come in and uh, they're competing with these other elements of the church and particularly over over preaching. The, the friars are, are limiters, that means that they're given a, a territory, a limit in which they may beg and um, they can only survive by the alms, the, the, the charitable charitable donations people give them and so they win these, they earn them by, by preaching. Uh, proclaiming the, the gospel often in the open air on raised wooden platforms was probably the most successful strategy for capturing a new following. The established parish churches tried to counter this challenge by exhorting the clergy, um, as at the Synod of Oxford in 1223, to preach the word of God and not to be dumb dogs, but with a salutary bark to drive away the disease of spiritual wolves from the flock. Um, although this may not have been a deliberate attempt to fend off the, the, the depredations of the priors, or the friars rather, it certainly sounds like an exhortation to meet the competition on their own terms. Exceptionally, some churches boasted an integral pulpit altar, famously as, like the one at uh, St. Paul's Cathedral, known as Paul's Cross, depicted there. So there's this competition over preaching, um, and it, it's in, in the vernacular, it's, 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 it's the, the priests who are doing it, but also the friars and, and the Lollards in particular find it a useful way to get their messages across. What about attitudes to reform? Um, as we know, the church was in rather dire straits at this period, thanks to the Great Western Schism, um, where from 1378 to, to 1417, uh, well, actually, it, 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 it started earlier than that. Um, well, that was, that was the period, I think, where there were three popes. Um, there are two popes, one in Avignon, one in Rome, and um, it, it, it's really embarrassing for the church. Um, the Council of Constance, 1414 to 18, would finally end this um, and and elect a single pope. But it, it takes a lot of a lot of negotiation, a lot of uh, discussion, a lot of a lot of effort to put the church back together after it splits into two, um, and and that's very embarrassing for the church. It, it, it's a challenge to them, you know, if if, if they can't decide who, you know. Saint 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 Peter's representative, uh, Saint Saint Peter's successor is, pardon me, God's vicar on earth, Christ's vicar rather. Um, then you know who can. So that's a factor in all this, um, and and it, it shakes the church. It doesn't destroy it. It shakes them though. And what doesn't, what also doesn't help the reputation, uh, has concerns particularly bishops, uh, who end up, end up becoming quite wealthy. Um, Bishops, monasteries, and monks had all become very unpopular as they owned so much of the land, they were effectively rich landlords. Remember, prayer is a commodity, and monks in particular can earn quite a lot of money praying for people, being given endowments to pray. They end up owning land, they end up raising sheep and, and selling wool, uh, which was a big commodity in those days. And the bishops, too, uh, seem to be raking it in. So this will have encouraged people like the Lollards to, to question the church, or at least to, well, to, to encourage some people to question individuals in the church who are seen as corrupt. That's what we call anti-clericalism. Um, the friars, whom we mentioned earlier, as I said, they first appear in the 13th century. They're clergy not attached to any particular parish, and indeed having no visible means of support, they have to beg. They rejected the monastic ideal of seclusion, though, and went to live among townspeople and survived by begging. These mendicant friars, mendicant means that means they're, they're begging, were enormously popular, much more so than priests or monks, who were often seen as rich and, um, and, 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 and greedy. The main orders of the mendicant friars were the Dominicans and the Franciscans. The orders of friars known as the mendicant order because of their dependence on begging, as I say, they aimed to live a life of, of poverty 
um, and simplicity similar to that of Jesus' apostles. Most orders banned ownership of property, which the rule of St. Benedict, as we've seen, did, and monks are meant to follow that. Um, and the friars were expected to live a simple life relying on the charity of others. They succeeded best in urban areas, as you could imagine, where there were large audiences for sermons and people to attend their services. They could beg for food and clothing, but were forbidden to take cash, and were not allowed to beg for donations while preaching, although, again, preaching is partly how they earned their money, and they did take money. They weren't supposed to, but they did. In an age where a parish priest might be illiterate, poorly educated, maybe giving little attention to parish sermons, the outpourings of a friar experienced in public speaking, you know, they're educated men. These are not, you know, random individuals with no education. They have, they have a good background in, 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 in scholarship. They travel the country extensively. They must have seemed like a breath of fresh air. Um, there appears to be a, a declining number of, of monks and nuns during this period, too, pr probably, again, affected by the back, well, certainly affected by the Black Death. Um, for whatever reasons, their, their numbers aren't filling out like they used to. There may be a sense, too, and I think this is evidenced by the Lollards, but also by the anti-clericalism that we see in Chaucer, that, um, oh, I should have mentioned, I didn't say already, that the, the church sees these friars as a threat, um, their, their competition. So this, this is partly why in Chaucer there's, there's this animosity between the monk and the friar. Um, but there seems to be a sense that the church is becoming out of touch and oppressive. Uh, consider all the different regulations against sexual activity. That, that was never popular, and, and people seem to have disregarded it. What happens to the Lollards? Um, we know that they were persecuted. A lot of it concerns a man named Archbishop Arundel. Um, he was elevated to the position of Archbishop of York in 1388, at a time when Richard II was, in effect, suspended from rule. Arundel supports Henry IV. And Henry IV, in turn, gives him quite a lot of um, latitude to, to do what he wants. Arundel was a vehement opponent of the Lollards. Um, and, um, as I say, thanks to, thanks to Arundel's influence, Henry IV will pass the De Heretico Comberindo statute in 1401, which um, recited in its preamble that it was directed against cert a certain new sect. I'm quoting from it now, who thought damnably of the sacraments and usurped the office of preaching. This law empowered the bishops to arrest, imprison, and examine offenders and to hand over to the secular authorities such as had relapsed or refused to abjure to give up their belief in lawardy. The condemned were to be burnt on, in a high place before the people if they wouldn't give it up. It was probably pushed through by Arundel. Um, its passing was immediately followed by the burning of William Sautry, a London priest. He had a previously abjured, given up lawardy, but then relapsed um, and had now refused to declare his belief in transubstantiation or to recognize the authority of the church. In 1407, Arundel resided at a synod at Oxford, which passed a number of constitutions to regulate preaching. This is the church striking back, not just at the Lollards, but at the Friars too, but especially at the Lollards. The translation and use of the scriptures, which would be forbidden or strictly regulated, and the theological education at schools and universities. In 1410, a body of Oxford censors condemned 267 propositions collected out of Wycliffe's writings. These different measures seemed to have been successful, at least as far as the clergy were concerned, and Lollardy came to be more and more of a lay movement. It went underground, uh, often connected with political discontent. The death penalty wasn't was, was seldom carried out though until 1410, and no further Lollards were executed um, after that. Uh, sorry, until, until 1410, no further Lollards were executed. There was an Old Castle revolt in 1414 that saw a minority of 70 or so who were hanged also burned as Lollards. Thereafter, executions were again few until the Tudor period. Um, Arundel had a stroke which left him unable to speak shortly after about 1414. And Henry V, who had uneasy relations with Arundel, installed Henry Chichele in his place. So from 1414 to 1521, there were trials and executions of Lollards, but it was under Archbishop Arundel that, um, that the, the most seemed to have happened. And with his death, 
they go into some decline. Um, we've talked a little bit about attitudes and actions of elites. We can consider some of Chaucer's examples uh, of anti-clericalism, where individuals who are corrupt are subject to criticism. There appears to be little or no actual criticism leveled at the church itself uh, or its doctrines from elites generally, uh, although evidence suggests that many paid lip service to ecclesiastical authority whilst behaving differently in their private lives. Remember the plaisance, um, the country home that was a, a place for sexual assignations, orgies amongst the uh, upper classes, and including some of the clergy. Certainly even the most ungodly elites like Sir John Hawkwood made it, remember him, made great efforts to preserve their memory um, as being true Christians through memorials, chantries, and donations to the church. Um, the church is big business, and uh, there's a kind of reaction to it uh, on the part of, of, of the lay community. So not everyone, obviously, can afford to endow a chantry chapel. It's just too expensive. Um, so religious guilds were established, and, and these sort of, they're, they're examples of lay devotion. They were devotional societies which depended financially on the fees of their members and on fundraising events such as feasts in the guild hall. They are examples of lay-controlled piety, although recent studies suggest they may not have been quite so lay-controlled as some scholars have believed. For a rising middle class who weren't rich enough to be able to endow a chantry or, or to pay a huge amount of money for, for a church building, they were a good discount alternative uh, for those wanting masses said for the souls of the dead. Some also provided social services such as almshouses, hospitals, and schools. Um, so that's going on too. And you can, sorry, you got these these lay communities uh, setting up their own. And they would have hired a priest. They would have paid for a priest to to come and perform services for them. But it's it's, it's as I say a discount version of what the upper classes were getting into. Um, patronage of parish churches. So apart from the manor, the church was the main focus of community life, as I've said. They were usually, um, the, the parishes were usually synonymous with the manoral villages. A parish priest was appointed by the Lord Mayor, or sorry, the Lord of the Manor, rather, uh, and, or with his approval, and was given a house. He was obliged to carry money for alms, and alms, again, is charity for the poor, with him, to keep up the church and provide hospitality for travelers. What were his duties? Well, the priest was usually a commoner by birth. Uh, those serfs were tied to the land and were not allowed to become priests. The priest officiated at church services, weddings, baptisms, funerals, um, visited the sick. He earned his living from the income from parish lands, fees for services, and tithe money. Tithing, of course, as I say, is a system where a person is expected to give one-tenth one -tenth, rather, of their earnings in support of the church. Uh, it could also end up being labor as well. And the, the money was used uh, to pay the priest, essentially, but, but also for church maintenance uh, and, and the poor. And, and a cut had to go to the bishop as well. Um, how was the church used? Well, uh, the chancel, where the altar is, belonged to the Lord. Uh, the nave and the tower belonged to the, the people of the parish. Manor courts were often held in the nave. Tenants came there to pay their rent. The rent, by the way, was called a scot. Um, a free meal was given to those who had paid their scot, hence the term scot free. Uh, it has nothing to do with the Scots in Scotland. It has to do with an old Anglo Saxon term meaning rent. And you got a free meal when you paid your rent. Also, to be scot free would, would imply that, that you know, maybe you were you were spared having you were your rent was deferred or something like that, or defrayed. Um, but it, again, it has nothing to do with the Scots. A church tower occasionally served double duty as the priest's residence <clears throat> and was often built to be defended in times of trouble. School was held in the, in the parish church. This would largely consist of um, teaching you know, the basic letters, reading and writing, but also going over um, the catechism and, and scriptures with, with people, with children. So the church's role went far beyond religion. It was really the center of, of the village's community life. Gifts of barley to the church were common. Um, the church reeve would, would have the barley brewed up 
into ale and sold to raise money for the upkeep of the church. And the term church ale uh, is still used today to describe fundraising for the church. Mystery plays. Um, these, are, these are interesting and a significant concept. Because very few people could read, biblical uh, stories were often acted out for the congregation in the form of miracle and mystery plays. So these evolved into cycles or collections beginning with the creation and ending with the last judgment. <clears throat> um, the ancient dramas were banned. Any other form of drama was banned. So the only thing that could be performed, officially anyway, was um, you know something from the Bible or from the lives of a saint. Pardon me. The, the plays were performed in the churchyard or porch of the church. In the 15th century, morality plays appeared in which moral vices combated like virtue and vice. Um, the, the miracle, sorry, medieval mystery and miracle plays began as serious church performances and developed into the colorful and theatrical spectacles later on involving the whole community. So initially, priests would perform the role, um, or, or usually until about the 10th century, when the clergy were banned, um, or sorry, 12, 1210 was, was when the, the, the clergy was banned. So um, they were banned from acting in public. So from that point on, it's, it's, it's lay people who, who perform the roles. <clears throat> and what, what were they about? Well, they were usually, as I say, depicting the lives of saints um, or stories from the Bible, often from the life of Christ. So we've heard about how Pilate, whoever played Pontius Pilate, had to have a loud, bellowing voice. Um, and in the story of Noah and the flood, Noah's wife is always sort of portrayed as an indomitable shrew. There are other ways of, um, of supporting the church and in which religion manifested. And I've got an example here, uh, which I'll show. The guy down there. No, back again. So I'm talking about manuscripts and primers, um, and I've got a recreation of one here. They look something like this, ornately decorated books. This is not an actual one. This, this is a, a notebook that I bought, I bought at Mount Grace Priory some time ago, but it's made to look exactly like one. So often covered in gold leaf, sometimes with jewels on them. Um, expensive designs, you know, throughout the expense is meant to be an illustration of piety. Um, and we can see this phenomenon of patronage in book production in the Middle Ages from, 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 from a couple of angles at least. The collective ownership of books was intended for the common use by religious communities. Um, that's one type. And the other is individual patronage. Uh, of a religious person or, or a layman, the phenomenon gradually took over during the 13th and 14th centuries. So books would be ordered for individual use. Um, they mirror a variety of personal interest. They were collected for the purpose of self-education and study, um, and satisfying one's eagerness for, for, for in information. A phenomenon of the ardent bibliophile, someone who loves books, uh, interest also occurs relatively frequently during the Middle Ages, people collecting books for the sake of having them. A specific kind of book intended for private devotion and contemplation of an individual was favored in the late Middle Ages. So you'll be seeing some examples of manuscripts and, and primers uh, from, from various individuals. There are, some of them are for the church, others are for, uh, owned by, by individuals. So in the early Middle, Middle Ages, the majority of books produced served as the liturgical books used by priests and monks in churches and monasteries. Uh, these books, especially Bibles, were seen to be the property of the titular saint of the church or the monastery in order to assure their attachment to that community and symbolize its continuation. Often we find the uh, representation of the titular saint depicted on the dedication page of a book or, or book opening, sometimes together with symbolic representations of the community. Um, the major need for new books occurred when a new monastery was founded. Um, as a common practice, the abbot of the monks came from an already established monastic, monastic community and then provided some of the most urgent books that they might need. 
um, other necessary books were then copied as soon as possible by the people at that monastery. We're, we, we, we're shown um, by the example of the first abbot of the French monastery of Saint Evreux, who himself copied a number of books and led a scriptorium there. This is a, 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 bun a bunch of monks copying books um, or, or priests. Amongst these, the abbot copied was the um, Antiphonary, the Gradual, and a Collector. Other books were, were copied by his companions, um, as was were excerpts of the Old Testament and its commentaries. So um, you're seeing some examples of processionals now. These uh, medieval processional was a small portable book um, containing music for the liturgical ceremonies. St. Giles' processional is now unique amongst medieval service books in providing color diagrams. And this is, you can see here in the image, um, providing color diagrams explaining how nine major liturgical ceremonies should be performed. It gave clear directions to the participants who would have included choristers, candle bearers, censers, and crucifers, cross bearers, as well as the officiating priest and his assistants. Um, the blessing of the branches on Palm Sunday it was depicted in this image here shows the flowers and foliage given by the clergy on the high altar and the offerings of the laity on its steps. The officiating priest is designated by a blue tonsured head above and a red and gold cape is flanked by the deacon and subdeacon. Other participants are denoted by the relevant symbol, a service book, candle, crucifix, holy water stoop, wand, and censer. So it's an instruction manual for how you perform, in this case, the blessings of the branches on Palm Sunday. And there have been lots of these ceremonies that required, you know, some kind of um, a book, essentially, to show them how to, to go about it. Um, and you'll be seeing some other examples in the images that I put up. <clears throat> um, I mean, another another thing that's very popular is 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 books by wealthy individuals. Um, so so the um, one that we've been seeing images from uh, shows this is from a knight uh, shows his property, but it's also a religious a devotion a devotional treatise, and so having this you know, person, an individual, a lay person having this, it's meant to be a sign of their of their religiosity, their their religious zeal, um, and that, along with other things, might indicate or seems to indicate a sign of elite withdrawal. Again, perhaps uh, in regard to the Black Death, there's a lot of private religion, a lot of private chapels, a lot of private donations to the church from wealthy individuals, and as as I say, less for charity. Wealthy or aristocratic families often built private chapels in their residences where they might have made had mass said by a chaplain or where family members might withdraw to pray individually or together. Um, voluntary religious organizations called confraternities or just fraternities also built private chapels for their own liturgical activities. Smaller in scale than, than parish churches, private chapels still would have an altar and reliquaries, portable altarpieces or sculptures, uh, medieval Christians not wealthy enough to live in a private home and have its own chapel might still devote a room or even a corner of a room to display their religious objects, like, like having a private household shrine. Christians in the Middle Ages expressed and strengthened their faith through public rituals, such as the celebration of the Eucharist <clears throat> and personal devotions um, conducted in a private chapel, a monastic cell, or simply a corner of one's home. Individuals sought to deepen their faith through study, meditation, and prayer, which might be guided by psalters or private prayer books. Images, usually modest in scale, helped in these devotional endeavors, um, since they, they made tangible the object of devotional practice, and there's an obsession with relics, of course, in the Middle Ages. These often reflected the, the wealth and rank of the individual, um, so rich, rich, Icons might be made of gold or ivory or silver or something like that, whereas poorer ones might be made of base material. There is a decline in charity, as I've said, during this period. So at the same time, there's, a, there's an increase in private religious activity. Uh, there's, there's a de decline in charity. Um, throughout the whole country, in fact, apart from, curiously enough, the north, uh, Yorkshire, presents itself as an anomalous region in the 14th century, charitable provision actually increased in Yorkshire. And, and Yorkshire was quite a larger territory than it is 
today. It's all of the counties of New Yorkshire, including where we are in, in Middlesbrough. <clears throat> um, so, but in the rest of the country, donations went down. New hospitals just weren't being founded, um, and the um, the church also seems to be serving more and more as an as as a location of elite burials. We've seen already um, Alice, well, the Chaucer family's tomb at Ulm uh, and other places where they're, they're interred, the, the elaborate, expensive shrines, or shrines, altars, whatever, that are put up to them um, in those places. The wealthy are giving less to charity because they're spending their money on these bequests, either for chantries or for other such things. Again, symbolic of the Black Death and, and the, the sort of issues facing that society. You'll next be seeing examples of doom paintings, and, and I mentioned these earlier. These clearly are a reflection of sort of attitudes at the time. Um, a doom is a painting of the Last Judgment, an event from Christian eschatology, eschatology about the end of the world. Christ judges souls, then sends them either to heaven or hell. Many dooms survive. Uh, from medieval churches from around 12, the 12th to the 16th century, which again spans the period of the Black Death, uh, although they were virtually standard in churches from, from earlier on. So they've always been around, but they become much more popular. They're used to remind medieval Christians uh, of the afterlife and Judgment Day, um, and they're often on, they're usually located on the rear of the Western Wall, uh, or at the front of the church, often on the chancel arch itself. And you can see the example that I put up there shows uh, it's in the shape of the chancel arch. Um, and, and so it would be constantly on view as, as people watch the priest during services. You'll see some more examples of doom paintings. They really do emphasize, you know, the death and the afterlife and punishments and reflect an obsession with, with death, which is understandable given the circumstances. Next, I put up some examples of, of roof bosses, and these in particular are the Green Man. We're not sure who this guy is. He might represent some sort of pagan deity, uh, some kind of fertility god. We're not sure. Uh, he seems to be a symbol of rebirth. At any rate, people are paying lots of money to have elaborate sometimes even gold, you know, with gold leaf on top of them, uh, examples of these things, or innately carved versions of them, put up in churches. And the roof boss, um, as you can see from the image, they, they just sort of go where the, the ribbing, uh, or the archwork of, 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 of a vault of a church would be. They're not structural in any way. They, they don't serve to reinforce. They're purely ornamental, um, and, and they're donations by wealthy individuals. Um, the green man would appear to be pagan, as I say, perhaps a fertility symbol, a wild man of the woods, yet he frequently appears carved in wood or stone in churches, chapels, abbeys, cathedrals, for example, can be found from the 11th century to the 20th. But again, during this period, um, there's a lot of these. So money is being spent on things like chantry and guild chapels, church extensions. So a lot of churches that were simpler in design get heavily elaborated during this period, um, as well as church fittings and decorations. Um, and you're seeing some examples now. So there's a, the, the case of a roof, of a, uh, the interior roof of a church. In this case, it's wooden, but with carved angels um, at, at every possible position ornate elaborations. The next one, uh, you'll see St. Peter and St. Paul's Church, Sale, Norfolk. Um, this is a good illustration of the kind of, of things that people were spending their money on. Uh, so you'll see lots of side chapels there. It's a chapel, Lady Chapel, um, the Assumption of the Virgin Mary Chapel, Chapel of St. James, um, and a number of side altars as well, smaller side altars. And these will all have been the result of private donations by wealthy individuals. And, and, and it would have these people's families' names connected with them as well. So it's, a, it's about promoting oneself, but you know, getting on the good side of God um, by dedicating an altar or, or, or even a chapel within a church. 
this is what they're spending the money on. The next images you're seeing are, are roof bosses, lots of roof bosses, and these are examples of the very ornate and elaborate ones. That um, gold and blue one in, in the lower right hand corner was a gift from was, was dedicated by the, one of the queens of England. I think it was Queen Isabella who paid for that one. Um, so that's real gold on it. The one in the upper left hand corner shows Noah's Ark and we're made to understand that Noah and his family uh, have, well, the, the way the, the artist apparently who designed this based their, their images, their faces on the family of the wealthy donor who had paid for this, this rather elaborate and expensive roof boss. But you can see other examples as well. Purely decorative, um, no other purpose than, than to, you know, to show someone spending their money. Here are some other examples of interior embellishments. So you can see um, a large window with, with complex tracery and, and some stained glass at the top. Um, again, in, in one, one type of the perpendicular style. There's a, a shrine that looks like above a stairway in one picture. And then there's a baptism, a baptistry, um, where, where, where infants would be Baptist with, with this extremely ornate covering you can see again in in the perpendicular gothic style reaching up to heaven somebody paid for that roof bosses you see some examples of those there's a pulpit uh, a very elaborate altar um, etc and again all paid for by wealthy patrons who who want you know to get on god's good side so um for the seminar, we're going to be thinking about these three tales, the friars, the summoners, and the pardoners, uh, and what they might tell us about attitudes towards religious individuals at this time. We've seen quite a lot already, um, and you know, the, the church figures so prominently into people's lives, they, they, they do effectively come into every class that we're, we're looking at. But um, we'll also think about things like the Green Man doom paintings and paintings and processionals too. So you might you might go see what you can find yourselves on the Green Man and why he keeps recurring in Christian churches. But we'll leave it there for now. Thank you very much for your attention, um, and I shall see some of you in the seminar. Okay.